Bert de Vries. Welcome on stage. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, and I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. It's a pleasure to uh, present our work. I'm going to be talking about natural artificial intelligence. Um, there is a contradiction between natural and artificial. By natural, I mean nature inspired. Let's see if I have the right. No. Yes. This is a graph from Gartner. Gartner is a market analysis firm, and they tend to put out hype cycles for uh, artificial intelligence. This just came out like a few weeks ago. On the horizontal line is time. On the vertical axis, you see the expectations from technologies, and the dots are different technologies. Um, so generally, as a technology goes through this uh, uh, over time. In the beginning, nobody has heard about it. Um, and then after some breakthrough, uh, th there is a lot of hype about it. Um, people think this is the next uh, best thing since the sliced bread, and it will solve every problem. Of course, it's a bit uh, over-promised. So after a while, people get down on it, didn't meet the expectations, and only then a, a very normal, we see a normal return on the investment where the um, eventually saturating out and, um, and the new technology starts. There's two interesting uh, technologies on this graph for today. One is generative AI, which we uh, have only since March of this year all heard about, and we're using it, and it's fantastic. And the hype is, is, is it's really on top, right? What I'm going to talk about is what's all the way in the left bottom. You have probably not yet heard about it. It's called First Principles AI, and goes by different names. I will call it Natural AI. So what I'm going to talk mostly about is this, this what is this Natural AI, this First Principle AI, what is it about? And we're probably a bit further along than this graph indicates. So first, Generative AI, um, we all know uh, and have played, I, I think, with uh, uh, OpenAI's um, chatbot, uh, 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 ChatGTP, and uh, perhaps you've played with uh, Midjourney to generate images, and it's, it's, it's fantastic, right? It's, it's amazing, it blows everyone away. Um, it really is a, a great productivity tool. So I'm not here to bash generative AI, I think it's a fantastic technology. There are also some downsides, namely you cannot ask ChatGTP to go out and learn how to ride a bike. It doesn't do real-time adaptation. You really have to train it on a big database. It takes a long time. And then you're going to, it, it compresses it in a big neural net and that you're going to use. It tends to generate images or text that could be true, that's very plausible to be true, but it could be completely wrong, right? It hallucinates and it's very hard to correct for that. It's very resource hungry to train it. I mean, it costs a lot of money, it costs a lot of data and a lot of computing power, and it's a black box. If it's wrong, well, we, you cannot explain how it got to the wrong answer. So that's a bit of a problem. And that contrasts quite a lot with how we, I mean, our own intelligence, natural intelligence. Right? How do we learn how to ride a bike? Well, uh, you, you, you can read a meter of books, but you still don't know how to ride a bike. You just have to go out and start riding a bike until you fail, and then you make actions, and you keep doing that. So there's real-time adaptation. As I will talk about later, um, the brain is also a generative model, but we get... Comp every, we get um, corrected by sensory inputs. Our perception is in, is in a way a corrected hallucination. In terms of resources, it takes zero engineers to learn how to ride a bike or to learn a language. You just go do it, right? The whole brain consumes about 20 watts and the cortex where the real stuff happens about four watts. That's the power of a bicycle light. Right. And, it, and it's not, we're not a black box. I mean, if we can 
explain our decisions when, uh, when, when queried. So natural intelligence is very interesting as compared to generative AI because it, it solves some of the problems that are still uh, bothering generative AI. So the question is, can we use, the, use how real, can we learn from how real brains work and put that in drones and, and, and in robots that, that uh, learn how to drive? Can we do extended reality, uh, smart cities? Can we create systems that go out in the world and learn purposeful behavior like we do just by interacting with nature without really an engineer involved for low power in real time? All that good stuff. That's the, that's the question that we're going to address in this presentation. Now, in order to generate or to, 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 to learn about how natural intelligence works, we have to learn about nature. How does nature work? And let's just go, a very basic thing is, I have a ball, right? Here is a, a ball at the upper left corner, and I throw it. And a bit later, the ball is at T1. So, and it takes, let's say it takes the, the black path. And you can ask, yeah, why would it take the black path? Why doesn't it take the, the red path? Well, um, if you, if you know or you remember something from physics, you say, well, that's Newton's law. Newton's law is force, is mass times acceleration. There is a gravitational force on that ball. It, uh, I can actually compute that path, and that's entirely correct. You can, you can compute the path of that ball with Newton's law. Um, the thing is, though, that Newton's law is not the most fundamental thing that you can say about uh, 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 about physics of that ball. There is an even higher principle. This is not a law, this is a principle from which we can derive laws. This is the principle of least action. It's very old, but it's not well known. And in words, it says, energy differences of any kind are minimized in, uh, or neutralized as fast as possible in least time. So if I would apply that to this ball and I would write down a function, this is not going to be a mathematical presentation, but a function L, which is called the Lagrangian. And that would represent energy differences for that ball, the kinetic energy minus the potential energy from a gravitational field. Then how, where the ball would go, so says the principle of least action, well, that difference is minimized in least time. So I take an integral over time and I minimize it. If I do that, I can actually derive Newton's law. Right? So Newton's law is not even the most fundamental thing. Principle of least action is above that, is an umbrella. Um, the interesting thing is that, so this, we can derive the physics for small things, for, for big things, but we can also derive the physics for small things by writing down a different Lagrangian minimizing it over time and derive the laws of physics for small things. Schrodinger's law, quantum mechanics. We can do the same thing for electric magnetic fields. We can write down the difference between magnetic and electrical energy, minimize the difference over time, and we derive the laws of physics for electric magnetic fields, which are Maxwell's law. So we can keep doing this. And what physicists, kind of as a joke, like to write down a Lagrangian on a mug and they say, well, this is how the world works. This is the Lagrangian, the standard model of physics. This, if you minimize this, that's just how everything works in the world, right? So um, what you want to remember is there is a, a, an umbrella from which we can de derive the laws of physics. And then we can ask a very kind of controversial question. We can say, well, a brain is a physical system. It should obey to the laws of physics. That means there should be a principle of least action. Isn't there a Lagrangian that the brain minimizes for its information processing? Isn't there a Lagrangian that would describe not the movement of little particles or big things or charged particles, but the movement of thoughts? Carl Friston claims there is a Lagrangian, and he, he writes down that Lagrangian. This is called the variational free energy. It doesn't matter, but it's 
a Lagrangian. And Carl Frischsen is the highest ranked neuroscientist in the world with an impeccable record. Um, and um, he derives this from very, very basic assumptions. It's a very fundamental derivation. And the interesting thing is that's all that brains do. So all your thoughts, all your beliefs, learning, attention, mechanisms, uh, um, or memory mechanisms, it's all a result of variational free energy minimization, of minimizing the Lagrangian or following the principle of least action is just physics. Information processing in the brain is just physics. Now, what does that lead to? I mean, how, how, how should we interpret it? It leads to the fact that the brain, being an organ that is connected in open communication with the world through sensory inputs and through actuators, meaning we can move, it can, it can apply, we can, uh, uh, we can move in the world, right? Um, it leads to the brain building a model of the world, a generative model. The brain predicts our sensory inputs. And um, it does that, that whole process is, is also called Bayesian inference. Bayesian inference is, means nothing but oh, we're using probability theory to do all this stuff. And it's, 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 we can prove that it's the optimal way of doing stuff. So in order to show that the brain is a generative model that actually hallucinates, um, here's a painting um, from uh, around 1590. And what you'll likely see here is a, a vegetable bowl, right? Um, if I turn that painting upside down, you will see a gardener, a face. Why don't we see immediately an upside down vegetable bowl? Well, we happen to see in the world a lot of straight up faces and very few upside down vegetable balls. So what we predict that we will see, what we predict that our sensory inputs will be, the probability for straight up faces is a lot higher than for upside down vegetable balls. The sensory imprint, what we receive on our retina is compatible with both. But since our, but what you really perceive is the fusion of your prediction and the sensory input, what you hallucinate and then correct it by sensory input. It's a corrected hallucination. Um, um, so there's a much higher probability for seeing straight up faces and straight up vegetables, vegetable, vegetable balls. So you don't see an uh, upside down face here. So that's how the brain works. And this is all due just through uh, variational free energy minimization. And this has been verified that even in vitro, by, 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 so by doing physiological experiments with the brain, there is a, a whole physical derivation, physics derivation, if you will, but there's also experiments with brains that f verify that, yeah, brains minimize free energy, variational free energy. So now we know the math of the brain or the physics of the brain, and we know it's in terms of information processing, all that brains do, right? And so it's, with that math, we can learn how to ride a bike, and we can learn languages, and we can move about, we can learn how to walk and, and make, make complex decisions, right? So um, what I've been interested in is in my lab at the university is to move this math to an iPhone or to another computer, put that, in a robot and tell the robot, now go learn how, how to ride a bike or uh, learn how to drive a car or learn a language, whatever you want to do, whatever we can do. If, if we use the same math, the robot should be able to do it. And so how difficult is that? Uh, that's extremely difficult. Uh, just, for, just for comparison, um, the, the brain has 100 trillion synapses which 10 to the power 14, so those are the parameters. So we are trying to minimize a function of 100 trillion variables. The brain apparently can do it, and it does it in real time. I can't, I can't learn how to drive a car if I'm not doing it in real time. It also does it a million times cheaper in terms of power consumption than regular computers. 
So it's, it's almost impossible to do it, and this is also the reason why we can't really build artificial brains, like how really how brains work. Um, now that uh, was a, uh, so in, in my lab, this is my lab at Eindhoven University of Technology. We, we started about eight years ago, and we have a lot of students now. We've studied, okay, how, how can we minimize variation of free energy in, in a way that we can use it for artificial intelligence? So these guys, they're very smart. They've written lots of uh, papers and dissertations. Here are four uh, recent dissertations. But more importantly, all that work ended up or is consolidated in a toolbox, a software toolbox that we're developing. And this so software toolbox is, is accessible. Uh, it's open source. You can find it at GitHub or there's a website, argsinfer.ml. Argsinfer is, um, is the toolbox. It turns out if you want to minimize variational free energy in real time, you're going to have to build a graph, nodes that send messages to each other. And as a result of that, your beliefs, your thoughts are changing over time. It's, we are an engineering group. We're not interested in biological plausibility. It follows from the mass that this is just the most effective way of doing it. Yeah, the brain does it also this way. It's neurons connected in a graph that send action potentials. There is a reason for that. It's just the most effective way to minimize variational free energy. This toolbox needs to, um, needs to be low power, needs to be in real time, it needs to be user friendly. So all, there's all these trade-offs in, 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 in complexity. So this is an ongoing project, right? The toolbox will never be really, really ready, but it's, it's functional and it's working. So what we do here is uh, we have here a double pendulum, which is a nonlinear system, nonlinear dynamics, and we, uh, um, we just observe, or our agent just observes the a noisy, version of that, of well, the bottom ball. You, you, you see these green dots, that's the observation. It needs to estimate the position of the pendulum. And you see in the shadow how it estimates it. So it does a really good job. Technically, this is a nonlinear Kalman filter. But if you would look at the entire code for this experiment, we never write down a Kalman filter. We, we write down a model, how we think the world works, and then we say do inference, which means minimize variational free energy, and, and then it tracks that pendulum. And we can also do decision making in real time. There is a classic problem that's called the mountain car problem. You have a, a slope or sort of like a valley, and we need to park the car on, on the slope, but the engine isn't strong enough. So the agent has to learn it shouldn't go directly to the parking spot. It should first go to the left-hand side get momentum and then get there. That takes intelligence that you actually go away from the target first. It learns that. The, there are other algorithms, but in our algorithm, it just does variation free energy minimization and nothing else. Um, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm gonna skip a little bit. These are agents that need to go to targets and uh, they, they should avoid collision, right? There's all kinds of variants, uh, variants you can do. So these are collision avoidance um, 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 vehicles, if you will. Variational free energy minimization, same algorithm. This is a moving world of pillars. There's hundreds of Asian agents that need to go to the right hand side and avoid colli colliding with the pillars. It needs to learn, I mean, it needs to adapt in real time to these moving pillars. So it learns actually in real time how the world works and it adapts. We also it should be low power. So we're actually doing this on a Raspberry Pi, which is just a credit card computer. It's very low power and uh, we put a little box around it and then we, we, we do it in, uh, in um, um, uh, in hardware so that, it, so that we can actually see that it works. We are an electrical engineering group. This is my last slide. Um, I'm going back now to this hype cycle for AI and with the two technologies. Generative AI, we, we love it. I love it too. It's fantastic. 
and first principles AI. So generative AI has a lot of green, but also some red. And first principles AI tends to promise, or let's say natural AI, how the brain works, tends to promise to, um, to, to, well, to solve some of these problems, right? Real-time learning, it's explainable. Um, very low power, no engineers. We learn just by ourselves going out through a sophisticated trial and error. Now, over time, this should happen, according to Gartner, right? We should get tired of these hallucinations that are uncorrected, that it's not explainable. And, and there's another technology that seems to solve it. Now, what's needed for first principles AI to, to actually to arise? Well, what is needed for generative AI? Very large databases, lots of computing power, and really good toolboxes, like TensorFlow and successors. What do we need for first principles AI? Lots of data? No because these agents go out in the world and they collect their own data. We don't need to read lots of books. We just go out and do it in real time. A lot of computing power? No. It turns out variational free energy minimization by nature consumes uh, all your computational resources. It, it will just lead to just good enough solutions for minimal computational uh, power. We do need a very powerful user-friendly toolbox because it's very difficult to, uh, to make these ages from scratch. So we're working on that in Eindhoven. My lab is a bias lab. You can go there and see more. We also started recently in a spin-out company to try to find clients that are, are willing to work with us on this. And uh, yeah, so um, my hope is that in the next three to five years, you'll see natural AI um, um, becoming more popular. If you want to learn more about it, go to any of these websites or uh, check out Carl Friston on, uh, on YouTube or anywhere you can, uh, you can find it. Thank you very much. Bert de Vries.